Well, hello everyone. Good evening. I told you I would probably be doing another show real soon and I've got, man, I am so behind. I have got a lot planned. As usual, if you are watching on Facebook and you care to, you would do me a big favor if you scooted over to YouTube to watch it there instead, I'm trying to build up my statistics there because it tweaks the algorithm and Facebook doesn't do shit for me, but make money for Facebook. But if you don't want to, that's okay too, you know, whatever. But if you feel like it, that would be awesome. I am not sure if the settings are correct on my home, my main Facebook page. So if I don't see your comments, that's why. And we're going to get right into this in a minute, but I got to give you the usual spiel. If you care for my content, will you please um, go to YouTube again, like and subscribe. It helps me out a lot and put somewhere here on the screen if you do get some value and you can afford it i do ask that you please consider becoming one of my patrons it's that there's opportunities at all levels and i would super super appreciate it i got a new patron last night and i can't tell you that made my day because i was having a shitty day up till then and then i was like so it gives me some affirmation. So please, please consider that. And um, Matthew uh, Butts, thank you very much. Uh, Michael Vance, I do not have the YouTube link. It's on my channel live. My channel's Pink Flame of Liberty. I probably, oh, I didn't turn my notifications off so you guys get to see each time I have a Twitter notification. Oh, well, this is... <laughs> my Twitter is blowing up. <laughs> oh my God. I need to learn to turn off my notifications. Ignore that. Ignore that on the screen. <laughs> okay. So what are we talking about today? I'm continuing from something I talked about. Was it Sunday night where we were dealing with some of the critiques of the LP and I brought up the term partyarchy which is, uh, I, I said I believed it was coined by Konkin, and I didn't have the definition at hand. And I was correct. It was coined by Konkin, and I have the definition here because I just think it's hilarious. And because it, like, was meant to be an insult, but I find it, I find good insults delicious, and I own them. So um, here is the definition. I'm going to stick up here if I can get that to switch over. Here we go. So, party arc. A uh, term coined by Samuel Edward Conkin III in 1972 to, dis to denote, and he put in quotes, anarchists who had rejected the state, head of the octopus, only to embrace its tentacle, a political party. <laughs> so yeah, that would make me a party arc, I suppose. I don't, I, I find it funny. I find it funny. So, uh, <laughs> I, um, I embrace it, but let's talk about exactly what that is, why I find that funny and why Konkin thought it was something so ridiculous. He needed to come up with a new term for it. And I've got some goodies for you. I have something I actually forgot to show you guys. What year is April in April 72? Okay. Now you've heard me talk quite a bit about the criticisms that the LP was getting, you know, and, uh, this is in, let me show you the cover. The society for individual Liberty would put out monthly like a little, I like to call it, if you know from, if you were ever in the independent uh, music scene, like a fanzine. Yeah, I used to be in that scene. But check this out. I wanted to get this that was on the back, the 1972 Libertarian Yearbook. I can't find it anywhere. So, unfortunately. But maybe, maybe one day. So, in the back, there is... right up there, a little column on the Libertarian Party. And it says, Libertarian Party sets funds goals. 
The newly formed Libertarian Party, now numbering more than 300 members, has set up several funds. And then it goes on with, that's not the important part. Where I want to go to, it says, their March 72 newsletter states that steady progress is being made, then quote, despite carping comments from a few Libertarians of the neutralizer or too pure to participate schools. And then it says, see elsewhere in this issue for Robert Lefebvre's impression of politicking. And I just like this stuff because you can tell this was old school. I want to see if I could show this to you. Right where my finger is, you can see there, I got it. Yeah, there was an error and they just said, fuck it. We're just going to type right over it. See right there. Uh, he misspelled politicking. I think that's hilarious. This is old school. He didn't even bother with like white out. Okay. Um, and here's interesting. They also give a suggestion that the LP did that if you get solicitations for donations from politicians, that they usually come in a postage paid envelope. So what they advise you to do here is use the postpaid envelopes which generally accompany such requests to convey liter libertarian literature to the seat of all that is unholy. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, but let's go to the Lefebvre article here. And for some reason, whoever owned this before thought that was important enough to circle. So Lefebvre article is here says Lefebvre comments on political action. All right. Robert Lefebvre, president of Rampart College, pulls no punches in an attack on libertarians who would use political action in the March RC newsletter. SIL's journal, The Individualist, published an article by David Nolan setting out the case for a libertarian political party. We read that before on this show. We quote below from his attack on the party concept. And this now is direct quotes from Robert Lefebvre. It seems to me that political action and libertarian thought are in opposite camps. The purpose of the libertarian should be that a condition of freedom be established. How does one assist in creating this condition through processes that implicitly deny this condition for some? Let's consider the political process. What does it involve? It is based on the concept that some men shall be chosen one way or another who will then rule other men. But the man who is free is the man who rules himself, not one who is ruled by others. Many have presumed that if they can impose their wills upon others and thus prevent others from imposing upon them, a state of freedom has been established. The condition of freedom cannot exist when some are imposed upon by others. It can exist only when no one imposes upon or coerces anyone. The essence of government is that some shall impose on others. To participate in the political process is to rely on forces to impose your will, irrespective of what it is, upon others. Should a libertarian do so, he has become an enemy of freedom and not merely the victim of a lack of freedom. Now, I found this very shallow. A lot of people find these arguments convincing, but let's break it down. Um, Jean, you know, Jean, I, I suck at spell, at, at pronunciations. So you say it's La, La Favie? You know me. I can't pronounce anyone's name. You're lucky I can pronounce your name, Jean. Okay, so let me explain why I think this is shallow. And I've got some other arguments here. Um, both of these from Tom Knapp, who, who, who dismantled this. But I wanted to give my own take on it first. A, first of all, um, La, what'd you say, La Fabi? Robert here is very narrowly defining libertarian as anarchists. Okay. I don't define that narrowly. I don't think that's fair, but in his comments, he obviously is limiting the word libertarian to anarchist because for a minarchist, none of these arguments made sense. And Knapp will get into this in a moment, but I don't think they make sense even in an anarchist context. And here's why. It's this last paragraph. 
says to participate in the political process is to rely on force to impose your will irrespective of what it is upon others is that true is there nothing that it would be legitimate for an anarchist to quote unquote impose upon others because he says irrespective of what it is so he says there is nothing that is very patently false Because, for instance, if you use force, lethal force, any kind of force to keep people off your private property, property, that is imposing your will upon them. Their will may be to trespass and your will is to shoot their ass because they violated your property rights or if they threatened you. You, 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 you hear what I'm saying? So this is completely wrong that relying on force to impose your will irrespective of what it is upon others is being an enemy to freedom everyone does that when you protect your rights you are imposing your will upon others it is a justified imposition but it is an imposition against someone who wants to violate your rights so this is self-refuting it's 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 very vacuous now we we might quibble where he says to participate in the political process well wouldn't that you know what is politics ultimately in and Kapistan there will be prohibitions against violations of rights those will be codified in some way and at its most basic concept rules customs whatever and the process in which you um come to that is politics hey twitter my twitter's blowing up um and i and gene put an interesting um comment here where he says robert wrote an article called uh, autarky not anarchy explaining why he rejected the use of the term anarchy and you want to know um what uh god i'm getting goals rothbard rothbard for a while also rejected the term anarchy and preferred non-archy um to me it it all ends up being um the same thing to me I, I think it's splitting hairs but you know it's interesting I actually if you want to be technical would say that I hold to panarchy not anarchy but we don't need more terms so yeah so I I found this this argument um completely uh shallow I'm sorry about that. You guys could just laugh at me not turning off my notification. Now you see how much Twitter buzzes at me all day. So let's go into some of the arguments that Tom Knapp did on this. And um, I like his title here. Confessions of an Increasingly Skeptical Libertarian Party Arc. (laughs) <laughs> so he also embraced the term but I want to tell you something funny I was listening to Tom Knapp's show um Napster and he made me laugh one time uh I joined the LP the same day that I decided I was a libertarian there was no gap literally like within five minutes I joined the party well within five minutes I changed my voter registration, which in Colorado is joining the state party. I joined the national party two months later because I didn't even know there was a national party. Mm-hmm. But um, hi, Twitter. And, <laughs> and I was, so that was September 14th. Yes, or is it 17th? September 17th, 2014. Then by, I think it was July 27th, 2015, so 10 months later, uh, 
I, in September 2014, I was a small government constitutionalist, and by July 2015, I was an anarchist. So it wasn't six months, it was 10 months, but pretty close. And I was listening to Tom Knapp's show at that time, and he was saying, people say that the Libertarian Party is not successful at anything. And he goes, that's not true. He said the Libertarian Party is really, really, really good at one thing. And that is to take a small government constitutionalist and turn him into an anarchist in short order. And I laughed my ass off because I felt that, man. I, 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 that was me. And I was reluctant I accepted that view, kicking and screaming. So let's see what Tom had here to say about confessions of an increasingly skeptical libertarian party arc. So Konkin had said that the libertarian party continues to co-opt idealistic young radicals suck out their ener their enthusiasm, disillusion them, and either drive them into pessimistic apathy or deliver them, radicalized and re-energized by their disappointment to the welcoming arms of agorism. I'm sure that does happen, but I think I'm an exhibit of how that doesn't happen. I've only gotten more radical and more energized than I've stayed in the party. So, um, and here's a, a comment from Matthew I wanted to stick up here, that the state doesn't need our consent, and they don't want it either. They could care less. Uh, state doesn't need to be legitimized. The state is forced. The state is oppression. The question is, what are you going to do about it? That's true. You can, um, you can howl at the moon, but that's not going to ha help. And, and I don't find the arguments that by participating in the political process, you are legitimizing it or you are agreeing with it. I pay my taxes, but I certainly don't agree with them. I pay them because I've made a rational decision that I prefer doing that rather than going to jail because I'm not going to be able to beat that. So it is a utilitarian decision. Participating in the political process is also a utilitarian decision. What are the choices open to me? What's the best I can make out of a bad situation? That doesn't legitimize it. But I had a friend, and I can't remember, I haven't seen him on Facebook for a long time now, but he was so adamant about these sorts of things. He said that if you have a driver's license, you just consented to the state. Really? Really? You know, that's like saying, if the state breaks your, your legs, you are righteous for refusing the, uh, the crutches. No, you're a fool. You got to make the best out of a bad situation. I agree with Gene who said, voting's an act of self-defense. It's, it's one of the few that we can do. And I understand and I respect people who choose not to use that. Because again, you have to, you have to choose things within your own rational self-interest. But, you know, I do not buy, you know, the Wendy McElroy, uh, um, you know, strict voluntarist argument that voting um, is violence. It can be, but it doesn't necessarily. If you're voting to, for somebody who would reduce aggression, that is not violence. That's like saying, um, you know, posing, uh, I, I'm going to go all um, Godwin here, that posing as a Nazi guard so you could rescue a few Jewish people from a concentration camp is somehow evil. No, you can't rescue them all. But if you can rescue a few, that's better than not rescuing anybody. And that reminds me, I actually have a real cheesy, uh, some people have like life parables. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the starfish story. And that, that story like really motivates why I do everything. So I'm going to give you the short version. Most of you have heard it. So you, the, the, and, and you've probably heard it in a different vision version, but here, here's the short, short version. So, um, you know, there's a kid. He's walking along the beach and he sees an, a man in, 
by the shoreline in the distance who is bending down, picking things up and throwing them into the ocean. Bends down again, picks something up, throws it into the ocean. So the young boy approaches to see what's going on. And as he gets closer, he sees that the beach is littered with maybe, you know, with hundreds, maybe thousands of starfish that are dying. They're, they're beached. And this man is walking along, picking starfish up one at a time and throwing them back into the ocean. And the boy says to him, why are you bothering? You can't make a difference here. You can't make a difference. You can't possibly save them all. And the man stooped down, picked up another starfish, threw it into the ocean and said, I can make a difference for that one. And that's always been kind of my life philosophy. You can always make a difference to that one. And that's better than not making a difference at all. So, yeah, that's kind of my whole argument on why I, I, I don't buy that strict voting is violence thing. If you're voting to steal from your neighbor, yeah, that is violence. But if you're voting to reduce, you're, you're righteous as far as I'm concerned. Okay. So, um, Tom Knapp continues. And he, 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 he weighs here and basically he's having like some self-examination. And he says, if Conkin's been right, I just wasted 14 years of my life. And he also says, it, it not only wasted it, perhaps I've harmed liberty. Um, and he said, maybe continued libertarian participation in old style politics stunts the formation of the institutions necessary to the coming revolution success. But he says, if Conkin's been wrong, then it's possible I haven't wasted my time. Perhaps a political party can be instrumental in creating the conditions necessary to the birth of a free society. And then he says, if nothing else, as I've ha held in the past, perhaps the Libertarian Party serves a useful purpose as a birth canal through which as yet unradicalized libertarians travel from the womb of the body politic to the brave new world of a larger radical freedom movement. And I think that second point is more correct. So, um... That was mostly what I wanted to um, get on here because um, when was this written? If I have the, it's not on here. Oh, here it is, 2010. Apparently at that time, we always have a lot of angst, don't we? Um, it says, he, he said, the Libertarian Party seems hell-bent on transforming itself into a center-right organization focusing on attracting fiscal conservatives who like a lighter touch of the nanny state's paddle to the posterior. <laughs> and he says, if that happens, then the Libertarian Party will be less than useless and an actual enemy of freedom. And this is a battle we're always fighting, isn't it? From 2006 up through 2012... I would say, we really flirted with the right way too much. The Libertarian Party skewed right from 2012, maybe 2014 through now, we've went the complete opposite direction. And I think that's just as dangerous and it will make the Libertarian Party less than useless, just like here. Um, we, we, we can't we, we can't do either of those things. So that's the one article. But apparently in 2009, Tom Knapp started, and I don't, this isn't around anymore, the Libertarian Party Anarchist Caucus. And he had, he had some better things here. He was arguing with someone named Daniel Shorthouse. I don't know who that is. It's, it's not really um, relevant at this point. 
and he says there's a fallacy in Konkin's argument and Shorthouse's argument. And the fallacy is the assumption that affiliation with a political party necessarily implies acceptance of the proposition that freedom can be gained through the political process. As a matter of fact, the coining and usage of the term party arc, specifically as a pejorative, seems to me to have that that fallacy built into it. It does. And so he says, I can think of at least two reasons for an anarchist to join a self-described libertarian political party, neither of which in any way implies acceptance of that proposition. The first is that a libertarian political party is a prime recruiting ground. Even at its worst statist extreme, a party like the LP is chock full of people who are already at the point of questioning the efficacy and perhaps the morality of the state. Exactly. So he says, yes, some of them will remain minarchists or even smaller good government types, but they're dawdling just barely inside the door of the temple of the cult of the omnipotent state. Some of them are bound to respond favorably to the guy who persuasively points them to the exit sign. So I think that is a good argument as well. The second reason is nothing makes for a better demonstration of the political processes in efficacy at securing freedom than, well, a demonstration of that fact. So that, that I don't necessarily agree with, but it's an interesting argument that he has. So, um, he says, nothing turns an open-minded minarchist into an outright anarchist faster than a window office over the floor of the sausage factory. So he says, there may be reasonable arguments against partyarchy on grounds of strategy, i.e. that our time would be more productive and spent in other areas. But the standard arguments fail because a key part of their premise is fallacious. I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. So I'm not even a, what did um, Knapp call himself here? Increasingly skeptical libertarian party arc. Uh, I'm not skeptical or reluctant. Um, I think it is a fantastic ground. And so I embrace the pejorative. You know, the way gay folks started, you know, the word queer used to be a pejorative. They owned it and turned it into an identity. And I'm doing the same with Party Arc. It just makes me laugh. I think I want to get a shirt with it. You know, I bought the domain name PartyArchy.com because I loved it so much. Oh, boy. Um, and there was one other thing I had wanted... Um, to point out here and then I can't you know I get I'm getting so old that I that I just whoop if I don't say it right away um I I lose it oh it was the argument also and I know David Nolan made this argument but the person who made it the best at, and it was during speeches at convention was Arvin Vora where he had said if nothing else running for office gets you platforms you couldn't pay for. And if you did have to pay for them, it'd be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. You get media time. It's not as much as we'd like, but particularly when you're running for local office, you get newspaper space, you get radio time. I was a line holder in um, a local race here. And I you know, I answered every questionnaire and I should have brought down one of them um, because so everyone reading these local papers got to hear my statement of, you know, what would you do in case of X? And I said pretty much anything but the government, you know, like I had got these really radical libertarian statements published. And I couldn't have paid for that. I would never have gotten them to agree to that. But simply by the fact that I said, okay, put my name on the ballot, I had this opportunity. And you can only get that in politics. 
So there is plenty of reasons to be a proud, non-reluctant, non-skeptical party arc. So I thought that was enough to want to do a little short segment on it. Um, and to see if there's any further comments to interact with. Otherwise, I'll probably be off for the night. Let me get a sip of my, uh, I need some caffeine. I wish it would give me better memory. It's pr this is probably what's killing my memory. I drink like 14 of these a day. What is that color that's in here? Like yellow number nine or something like that. That's supposed to like make you radioactive. I don't care at this point. Too old to care about that. So, um, Jean had said, uh, I wanted to add this because this has a, a, been a big controversy amongst some people. Ayn Rand said she accepted Social Security payments because she viewed it as an act of reclaiming stolen property. I can understand that argument. And um, if I live that long, I'll accept it as well. Um, you know, we arguably, we paid into it. I mean, that's not arguable. We paid into it. It's arguable, though, whether it's right to recover stolen property from someone other than the thief when you're talking about something that is so fungible like money. Let me explain. We paid into it but it's not sitting there in an account waiting for us. The only way we can reclaim it is by stealing, by, by, by the state stealing it from younger people. So I do see that as problematic. I don't think there's an easy answer with it. I don't judge people who accept it. I'm going to accept it, but I also understand people who say it's immoral to accept it. Yeah, it sucks. We didn't voluntarily pay, pay into it. We got stolen from, but that doesn't give us the right to recoup it from the state at the expense of somebody else. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, Walter Block called this negative homesteading, which is a really interesting concept. And he also said, you can't transfer your misery. And the example he gave was, say there's two people standing in a field and um, a lightning is about to hit one of them. Of course, this is a thought experiment. This isn't how lightning works. I get it. About to hit one of them. And that person could deflect it but when he deflects it he knows it would instead hit the person next to him in deflecting it he's defending himself but knowing that it would then hit somebody else you can't do that you can't transfer your misery and arguably that's what's being done by um accepting social security payments um, the fact is, we don't live in a tableau rosa. You know, we're, we're, it's not a clean state. It is not always so easy to untangle the Gordian knot of aggression. We try, but I do believe we don't fool ourselves either, that, that we really look at it soberly. All right, that is pretty much all I've got for tonight. It's so good seeing all of the regulars and chatting with you guys. Um, I will close out with the pitch again. Please, please, if you can support me, it would mean a great deal to me. Link here somewhere for my uh, Patreon and in there, we, I do book stuff in there as well as bonus episodes. I'm going through Judge Gray's book right now, All Rise. And then I've got some really obscure libertarian works I'm going to be going through. Like I found some old stuff like, oh, who's that guy? Um, Jarrett. Oh, crap. Let me, it was in this issue. I am telling you my memory. I think it's Jarrett Wollenstein. Yeah, Jarrett Wolstein, who, who wrote a book, um, 
crap. I don't remember what it was called, to be honest with you, but it was really like some free market solutions and it was super rare. It took me like a year to find this book. So we will be doing things like that. But right now we're doing the Judge Gray book. So please, um, if you can, and uh, yeah, for those of you, I'm going to be recording a bonus episode tonight for my patrons. So that will be it. I hope you all have a good night and probably Thursday night, I'll be recording another episode. Well, at least another live one. I might do a pre-recorded one before then. So have a good night, everyone. Love you much. You gotta take what you're given. That's how we live it. Don't be mad at the system. It's simply how we've existed. I hear a lot of people talking like they politicians and choose to be an accountant because it's safe in a business. Not because they want to